I'm Bob Pollack. My colleague Cynthia Peabody is sitting right over there and perhaps would stand up so everybody knows who she is. Cynthia and I are co-directors of the Center for the Study of Science and Religion and tonight is the final seminar in our public seminar series for academic year 11-12. And because it's the way we are, we save the best for last. Um, Tony Leckage is a friend of mine for many years. He has a recollection of how we met at a New York Academy of Sciences session. I have no memory of that. I feel <laughs> we were raised together and we know each other all our lives. I cast about for a way to introduce a friend and I know the worst way to do it is by a CV. It just misses the point. So I turned to an article in the Journal of Medicine and the Person published by the Catholic organization Communion and Liberation where a colleague of mine at Columbia, Elvira Paravicini, wrote an article about Dr. Lekic called A True Look at the Value of Life, Terence Cardinal Cook Health Care Center. And she opens the article, which was published in June, I should say, last year. Um, quote, I would use the famous quote here that Cardinal Cook favored. Life is no less precious when accompanied by sickness. These are the words Dr. Lekic from the Terence Cardinal Cook Healthcare Center chooses to describe the place where he works and the place he loves. He continues, this was his exhortation to all of us to care for the least of our brethren. Dr. Lekic is the medical director and senior vice president for medical affairs at the Terence Cardinal Cook Health Center. He'll tell you what that is, but I will tell you that what it means to me is that he is a teacher to me to Cynthia, to our colleagues at Columbia, of what the distinction is between illness and disease, between being alone with a sickness and being in a community caring about you, whether you're sick or not. Tony is in many ways the most uh, valuable person I know for those of us who gain episodically the courage to admit our mortality. And that makes him a really important guy Here's Tony Lecky. So I dressed important. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here. At uh, it's really an honor to be called upon to speak in this prestigious, wonderful university, which we've lived in the shadow of for the last 25 years. Uh, the community is a uh, wonderful, vibrant community, and I'm, as evidenced by the group uh, here, to assemble here a little bit about what we're trying to say today. Um, I am, uh, uh, again, honored, and uh, I hope tonight turns out to be what I uh, would uh, really want to be a dialogue. Uh, maybe at the end we'll have some good questions and comments about the topic at hand. Uh, I've brought some guests along. Uh, the topic, uh, where has all the caring gone, is a redolent of the 60s uh, where I substituted caring for flowers. Uh, but uh, uh, in fact, there is, a, there is a problem. I think that, uh, and we'll, we'll see it as we go along, there seems to be a drift, if, uh, if not a tectonic shift away from some of the things that constituted care and medical care and healing over the centuries and way back into antiquity. Uh, we're in a different time right now. So I think some of the things you'll hear about are attempts sort of to grab some of those things back, holistic medicine, the whole person, person-centered care. Uh, so uh, in case I get really boring, I brought some extras. Uh, extra talent, I should say. Um, Mila Rose Villasaran is going to get up later on and talk a little bit about her perspective as a nurse. Norma Coleman, a certified nursing assistant. Uh, gonna, uh, they were, and Sandra Joseph, uh, who, thank God you made it, um, <laughs> is going to, they're going to give us a, a perspective uh, from their respective professions. So, um, I'm delighted that they could join me. They were handpicked for this occasion. What really led to this discussion was uh, the somewhat 
I guess, mundane observation that when you walk down the halls of Terence Cardinal Cook or any hospital, certain people strike you as nice and caring, and they seem to have a natural aura about them. Uh, there, there are others who don't quite cut that picture. Uh, hospital, the movie Hospital comes to mind, the woman behind the nursing station who kind of looked up uh, in that sort of motor vehicle bureau way. Uh, so, um, so I started to query uh, not only among the friends and people, uh, my new boss, Mr. Carkenny, uh, what is with that? Why do some people sort of have this meter on their head that tilts favorably and others don't, the care meter? What do the high scorers have that the others don't? Can we measure it? Is there really some kind of meter to measure what spirit drives them? Can it be constant? Well, the answer is no, right off the bat. But can it sort of be there more than it's not? When does it count most? And we see that uh, in some of the examples you'll see today. There are some days when it really counts, some that maybe it doesn't count as much. How pervasive can it be? The Calvary Hospital comes to mind as one of the great examples of a pervasive caring environment. As soon as you drive in with your loved one who's about to enter the halls of dying, uh, you're greeted by the parking attendant. And immediately, you're comforted by having a parking space, for one thing. Uh, and you're welcome. And Mike Brescia, the great Mike Brescia, Dr. Brescia, who's been there, and Jim Semino, the two founders of Calvary Hospital, both of them set the stage for that. They went through that place from head to toe. They made every single person in that place understand what it means to come in with a loved one who you are taking into their rest, final place of dying. Uh, so Calvary uh, met that criteria as a large act. St. Vincent's, the old St. Vincent's, which uh, brings tears to my eyes, uh, was also one of those places. And now, you can have small acts. They can be diminished to a little smile or a little twinkle of an eye or just a, a, a touch of your shoulder or, or a touch of an arm. It can be tiny, but it still matters. Is it simply sho showing the sick or, in fact, each other that we love them? So what are the origins of the hospital? There's some questions we're going to try to answer tonight and maybe take some, uh, again, questions at the end. What are the origins in the high scorers? Where do, the, where do these people come from? What makes them tick? Why do they have this beaming quality about them? Why do they seem to get into the relationship and the bond of caring? How does it relate to our work in a highly dependent patients, including the dying, the AIDS patients? I didn't really go into Terence Cardinal Cook, but we have among our uh, patients uh, people suffering with AIDS, late stage HIV, late stage Huntington's disease, uh, children of great disability, often uh, respiratory dependent, uh, literally unable to speak or even see in many cases. Uh, we all relate to those and, and try to do our best but how do we get the carers to really reach them on some level? I've always taught and felt that uh, for each encounter with the resident in the room when you enter a person's life, that they're better for that encounter when you leave. Just leave them with something positive. Uh, is this really doable? Well, we, we're trying. It's a good thing to strive for. So we'll explore these ideas tonight and have other participants relate, uh, ladies, uh, and then we'll discuss this at the end. So um, I actually bro broached the subject to Daniel Sumezi, one of the great philosopher doctors uh, in our community. Uh, Dan uh, is a gifted guy who's written more than I can carry. Uh, so his first suggestion on the top topic of caring was Warren Reich. Uh, Dr. Reich is uh, founder, of, director of the project for the history of care. He says, you want to learn about care? Read Reich. So off I went, and in the Medical ethics literature, Reich was the, one of the principal authors of the Encyclopedia of Medical, Medical Ethics. And uh, that led me to a few pearls that I want to share with you, uh, which I had never known before, and hopefully you hadn't either. When you go back in the literature, according to Reich, uh, you go to the uh, collection of myths edited by Hygienus. And apparently, that was where the fount of ethics of caring really began. So I'm going to read you a little story, uh, which is basically the myth from which care seems to emanate. Kura, 
care, is crossing the river and picks up mud out of which she shapes a human being. Along comes Jupiter, major god, and Kura asks him to give the clay the spirit of life. He does. Care wanted to name the human after herself, but Jupiter insisted that his name should be given to the human instead. While Care and Jupiter were arguing, Terra arose, which was really the grandfather of Jupiter and father of Saturn, and said that the human being should be named after her, since she had given her her own body, Terra, or Earth, the original life force of Earth, guided and guided Jupiter's rise to power. Finally, all three accepted Saturn as the judge. Saturn was known for his fairness and was the son of Terra and the father of Jupiter. Saturn decided that Jupiter, who gave the spirit to the human, would take back its soul after death. And since Terra had offered her body to the human, she would receive it back after death. But, said Saturn, since care first fashioned the human being, let her have and hold it as long as it lives. Finally, Jupiter said, let it be called homo, since it seems to be made from humus, Latin for human being. This has been suggested to imply that the word care contains tension, pulling down to the earth a worry and spirit element that drives it up toward the divine. The positive side of care dominates the story, for the primordial role of care is to hold a human together in wholeness while cherishing it. Pretty cool. So many lessons are here for us by way of, the, this is Reich's comment on the myth. Many lessons are here for us by way of this wonderful mythology. The myth teaches that the most notable characteristics of the origins of life and destiny of humans is that they are cared for. It also suggests that humankind as a social totality is brought into the world and sustained by care. Since it binds human together, care is the glue of society. That's pretty heavy. <coughs> so, there are uh, themes throughout these considerations of the ancients where anxiety versus comfort seems to prevail, which stands to reason. Uh, I worry about you. I care about you. Uh, we see also uh, from Seneca, a Roman philosopher at the time of Nero, apparently he was Nero's advisor, can you imagine? Um, in humans, the good is perfected by care. Solicitude was his word. He really spoke to, he really was the originator of beneficence, doing good for the other. In German, kar means trouble or grief. In the modern German, trouble or, uh, um, trouble, that's redundant, but it carries through into the modern. This was ancient and modern. But the second meaning is a concern for people. And this also, again, permeates the literature and the philosophy of care. It's a tension. If you care for someone or something, you worry about it. So basically, it becomes the backbone of all moral life, beneficence, again. So early on, somewhere in the early centuries, the care of the souls was, was singled out for the troubled person is in a spiritual way, in a religious context. Uh, it was uh, really looking at the meaning of life. And the term really connotes a helping by healing acts of reconciliation, penance, more, more subjective and interactive. But again, it speaks to this, this need to bond with our fellow human beings. This notion transcends the physical and goes to the health of the personality. It was really the originating notion of holistic medicine. The sufferer, however, must accept the care. And this gets played out in later parts of this discussion and in as you can imagine in your mind. The little children on the pediatric ward who really can hardly respond appear to respond in a big way to the people, the grandmother volunteers who hold them and walk around with them all day, Father, you would attest. Uh, they find response where we can't. So it really does speak to the miracle of caring in, in a big way in that particular unit. By the way, you're all invited. This dipole of the carer and the cared for carries through the literature. Probably the best way to summarize the philosophy, the philosophical thought on caring comes out of Milton Meyerhoff's book on caring, written in 1974. There is uh, basically, after fairly dense uh, reading, uh, you can extract from that in the care 
in the care dipole, certain elements and adjectives that really obtain. And we hope to reach and deliver on some of those in our examples that we'll give later. But just to, to rattle them off, I know it's a busy slide and distracting and PowerPoint teaches you never make them too busy. But it's a long list. I didn't know what else to do. Break it up, six slides. I don't think that's necessary. But these you can intuit uh, if you just sit and think as um, the last 4,000 years of people have done. Intentionality. It really intends, you need to intend for the person to reach some actualization, to reach some different point. If it's in the case of a dying person, to make those last light moments on earth an, um, an opportunity to actualize. I had an experience, very moving one the other day, where a gentleman was still riding his motorized wheelchair three days before his death with gangrenous hands. He was isolated from his family from a life of somewhat uh, um, complicated life, as they say, um, but came to realize that he was nearing his end. He was off at Calvary Hospital. Uh, we had a private moment in the, in the room where he said, no, I think I'm going to stay here. I like it here. And I like you, he said. Uh, and he said, I love you. And I sat and held his hand and talked to him, and he was able to reach some kind of peace in those last few moments peace that he couldn't reach with his family who only came after he died, they wouldn't see him in life. Uh, so it can work right down to the end to actualize himself. Trust, devotion, patience, alternating rhythms, humility, honesty. Well, trust is an obvious one. Uh, you really have to gain that and win that over. Devotion, you have to really take the time to be with, be there, and you know the philosophers nuance these words uh, and they're interesting. Being there really means to be on call. Uh, being for is to be sort of rooting for the person so they, they can actualize, they can do something. Being with is just to be next to. Uh, these are interesting parsing of words, and there's a lot of that in the literature of medical, medical ethics. Patience, you can't rush things. Uh, you really have to wait for it to unfold before you. Alternating rhythms. Good days, bad days. I'm into it some days. I may not be as into it another day, and so on. So we'll, uh, we'll keep those in mind and come back to them later when we talk about our, our patient. Now, there are many barriers. If we sat without the slide and try to figure, the, figure them out, we'd probably come up to the same list. The medical profession and the healing professions, to my, in my view, have descended from the trusted healer to a problem solver. From a to coin an unpopular word with Jerome Groupman, one of my favorite medical writers, provider, and the patient is a consumer. <laughs> and he goes on in a wonderful editorial that you must read um, to describe that with his other author as being uh, most upsetting and demeaning in a way to the actual acts that we're talking of which we speak. Patient autonomy movement, with all due respect, uh, and it was important that doctors were not walking on water forever. Um, God knows they sunk a long time ago. Uh, but the autonomy movement, well-intentioned as it is, actually the pendulum maybe in some instances has swung too far. Without the paternity, when I go to the doctor, I'm not so sure I want all the rights and privileges that uh, are taught. I want to hear something from on high about my future and my life. Ruinous litigation speaks for itself. There's this notion of medicalization of things, worship for disease. We have all the ICD-9 coded diagnoses. We have the DSM-4, not unless it's DSM-6 now, uh, where they pigeonhole people by diagnoses, and in that sense, dehumanize them. In this great school where my wife graduated in, in psychology, the chairman of the department, uh, the one lecture I sat at spoke about the label, to label me is to destroy me, which I, I never forgot, Dr. Jordan. The office visit in some ways becomes a reductio ad absurdum. Did I say that right, Father? Uh, <clears throat> a reduction to an absurd degree, where the, you walk in, I got this pain, I don't feel so good, I can't sleep, take this pill and I'll see you later. Uh, the, Care guidelines, the evidence-based, I just threw this in because there were several editorials, recent editorials, which kind of impugned the notion of care guidelines. 
while it's good to have evidence-based medicine helping guiding us, it's not the total answer because the evidence upon which it's based is still controversial. Screening mammograms, for example, became a highly controversial subject, et cetera, et cetera. So you can bring your evidence base into the relationship in the office, but you, you certainly should uh, keep the patient's individual experience in mind and then use the evidence to the, best, uh, to the best end to serve the patient. There's a laptop now between the patient and the doctor, uh, which really bugged my uncle in Florida. Uh, so the guy's looking at the computer. He's not looking at me. I could have been dead already. <laughs> there are many communication perils. Uh, and this I just uh, allude to uh, difficulties with sensory differences as in deafness, uh, difficult with heavy accents and cultural disparities where the communication things are critical things and meanings are lost. Words convey many meanings. You saw in the long list Hope was on there. It was a wonderful lecture by Nancy Berlinger, the deputy director of the Hastings Institute, on the nuanced meanings of hope. Hope comes up pops up all over the place. Uh, hope in the sense is not something in the future by these writers. Hope is something to visit upon and give and appreciate in the present. Hope is something even in a dying man or woman that is always there. Hope for something in the hereafter or hope for something in the next minute that may be better than the minute before. It's a plenitude of hope. It's in them. The fragmentation we all know about. There's hospitalists here. There's, there's even an editorial on sub-subspecialists, which actually was a pro uh, discussion by K Chris Cassell in the New England Journal of Medicine, where they're actually advocating more sub-subspecialization, for God's sake, so, uh, and so on. The nurse uh, doctor, the nurse patient relationship, Neil, you can attest now or later, uh, the time with the patient has been shortened. The demands of documentation have overridden the demands to actually hold somebody's hand and talk to them and comfort them and nurture them, which is where the word comes from, nurturing. There are high-tech demands where nurses are more di dialing up uh, machinery, are worrying about pumps and such, uh, also detracts from the other side of care. Not that the IVs aren't part of it. They're necessary. Morphing, nurses morphing into physicians. Uh, is also an issue. It's almost like a, in a, in a sense, I don't want to be careful with my words, uh, denigrates perhaps the original intent to become a nurse and then morph uh, in that direction. Polypharmacy, just to give t 10 drugs to a person three times a day, uh, although they say giving the drugs can be an opportunity to talk and care uh, for the patient, but there is the documentation and worry about side effects and notify the doctor, and there's so many things that can get in the way. Risk management doc documentation. The nurses' aides have their own set of demands, which uh, the workload, especially in the nursing home, and I'm sure in the hospital, uh, it has gotten more and more toward heavy lifting, heavy doing, heavy documentation, more patients, less time to care for the patients and dignify them with your joke, with your hand, with your kiss. It gets, it gets more and more difficult to, to get the, and they're the closest to the, to the person. They are there skin to skin uh, in the most intimate relationship, especially in the great need uh, time of a person's life. And they're pulled away just like the rest of us. The training is shallow. We'll talk a little bit about that. The support in, in, in the staff, often scanty, not enough appreciation, not enough talking to the aides. And we'll hear, hopefully, from them directly. <clears throat> we did have an experience uh, at TCC, which I just put out for a second, where we had a support group for CNAs on the Huntington's unit. Huntington's disease, a devastating disease that we have uh, in our home. 50 residents in uh, TCC are afflicted with late stage Huntington's. Huntington's is a almost inexorable progression, very slow progression of psychological, cognitive, and motor toric decline. Uh, we see people through uh, various stages on to a long tail of existence where they're totally dependent. So the AIDS taking care of those patients, we held support groups for them. We talked to them about what makes what they what we could do to make their job a little better. 
And the, I've recorded a lot of those comments and I have them in a, in a diary and a log. But mostly they needed to hear from us. They needed to hear words of encourage, encouragement, appreciation. And when they needed supplies, they needed them right away. They didn't want to run up and down the halls looking for them. So that being said, we're going to turn to a case which uh, I think illustrates a lot of these points and a um, particularly moving case. Now, we have roughly from seven to eight to 15 to 20 deaths per month at Terrence Garden Cook, uh, which is a lot of people in the end of life. Uh, there are additional deaths that occur in ho during hospitalizations. We're using this example to kind of show uh, some of these, some of these uh, features uh, that we're speaking of. Uh, P.H., uh, uh, Peter, uh, was an 88-year-old patriarch of an Irish-American family. He was doing well, uh, self-sufficient, and living independently until a tragic 15-foot fall over a banister produced multiple fractures. He was in a townhouse and he just toppled over, down, literally crushed on the floor. Um, by the grace of God, or perhaps not, or perhaps so, was, did not die immediately, was admitted to uh, Lenox Hill Hospital for a long, at least three month hospitalization in and out of the ICU. Pneumonias, cerebral uh, contusions, subdural hematomas, on dialysis. He actually underwent renal failure during this. But the old warhorse that he was, it didn't go easily. So he actually was finally admitted to Terrence Cardinal Cook after over three and a half months of, uh, of hospitalization. When he came in, uh, the son and daughter were present. Uh, they were frightened, exhausted, uh, but yet hopeful that since he got through all those admissions, he might be able to rally. He was sedated upon arrival, but rousable at times. He was on heavy pain medication, antibiotics, a renal regimen for the renal failure, medication for other comorbidities, wound care. He had decubitus ulcers, contractures. He basically kind of laid there in the bed in a heap. He could only speak a word here or a word there or a grunt in the beginning. Now, when a patient like this comes into the nursing home, they undergo the usual gamut of tests. I should say gauntlet was the real word. Um, they need to be evaluated from head to toe with this document called the MDS, which I spoke of last time I stood here. Because I get PTSD just talking about it. Uh, there's 640 questions which basically are the product of a room full of bright people who don't work in nursing homes, who decided to create a questionnaire that would get every detail uh, on, a, on a newly admitted resident or person. It's sort of like the doctor's office when you come in and he, he checks off a list like Rita Sharon, the narrative medicine professor, said she doesn't do. Uh, and do you have headaches? Do you have problems with your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your neck? And they work down um, and so on. Well, we have such a thing, and it's a very big, complicated affair. And what happens after you test, sort of check positive in certain areas, you trigger for care plans. It's an ingenious tool. I'm not going to lie, it really is ingenious. But it's, it's constantly upgraded, and it creates care plans for your dementia, for your wounds, for your skin care, for your fevers, for your blindness, for your this, for your that. And all the people on the team have to respond to each care plan. So if you have 10 or 15 triggers, you have permutations up to 15 times 10 of things each person's supposed to do with these care plans. It's a, it becomes a um, very complicated affair. He lit as many of these triggers as I have seen. So what I'm gonna get into now a little bit is the question of why some of us seem to be inclined, perhaps more than others, to come into these situations with a, let's say, a caring attitude. I look at myself first, and just uh, kind of examine my own childhood, my own personality. Uh, I had experience uh, entering kindergarten at just turning four. I don't know, that was some deal in the Bronx. Uh, and uh, I was a sort of a young-sided kindergartner, anxious, uh, worried, really wanted to be home listening to Arthur Godfrey. Uh, but I appreciated, learned early, the kindness of strangers and classmates. I always had a sort of sense to keep things alive. We had goldfish when I was a kid. I hated when they got sick and started to do that horrible goldfish, uh, uh, you know, it's coming. Uh, I 
I did put salt in one bowl and actually revived one, and I was thrilled. It was normal saline, I guess. Uh, and I never forgot it, Bartholomew. Uh, the uh, plants, uh, I'm, people make fun of me because I have plants in my office with one live leaf in it. Uh, I love hearing stories of people's lives. Uh, I take a lot of pleasure in that, and I've heard great stories in 40 years of nursing homes, believe me. Um, I was taught to venerate all people in, in my house, and I had a pre, pre conversations with my wonderful colleagues here, and they seem to have all shared those kinds of things. We were taught to revere the elderly. That was a cultural thing in Croatia, uh, and it's true for many, many cultures. I think the internship at St. Vincent's Hospital, which uh, drew me out of downstate medical school for mystical reasons, I put that, ranked them number one. I never saw the place. I just felt that I belong there. I wanted to give back to the community. And I met my colleague, Dr. Kellogg, there early on because I felt that the privilege of medicine should be given back. And that was a good, as good a place as any. So from the Sisters of Charity at St. Vincent's, one of whom is in the room, sister, uh, I learned uh, the lessons as a physician. I'll give you a quick one. In the emergency room uh, where I worked the first rotation was really interesting. Uh, you'd see the guys from the Bowery, I'm not gonna say bums, but that's what we used to call them, and they'd come walking down the hall, flies circling their head, matted hair. You, you can't begin to describe them properly. And they would take a, a hard right, accompanied by two nuns, into the tub room. And, uh, and we'd be working and doing and working, and the next thing you know, they would say, Dr. Lekic, your patient is ready. And the guy would be sitting on a gurney, shaved, hair combed, usually rum-faced, but shaved, and uh, with a twinkle. And I realized that they just dignified this man in a way that uh, I can't even. Maybe we can build another one, sister. Uh, St. Vincent's, uh, I just, uh, did, there were wards in St. Vincent's. And there were eight beds in the ward. So when you're an intern, you're sitting on the nursing station and the nurse is sitting next to you. She's a St. Vincent's nurse. She's trained in the spirit of. And you hear the coughing, wheezing, puking, whatever it is in the other big ward rooms. And you hear sounds that worry you and you get up. She doesn't move. Then you don't hear anything. She jumps up and runs like somebody just called fire. Uh, what did you hear that I didn't hear? Joe is having a problem. I know that sound. And that was the kind of gestalt that you had on St. Joe's West. You'd, hear, you'd see nurses able to care from the doorway. I can't even talk about it. It chokes me up to think about it. And there's on Joe's West, I saw my first patient die. And, uh, uh, that made an impression, so I went out for a smoke when it used to be good for you. <laughs> so uh, what did I do with this, uh, this man and his son? Well, um, I heard that he was complaining there was something, the pain meds were not right or something was cockeyed, so he was upset. And uh, that's a signal, you better hit it fast, because usually if the family's upset, there may be legitimate things they're not getting, but they're also reflecting that this is really tough for them, and they're going to find fault. So I ran down there, and uh, uh, the son was uh, uh, at the bedside, um, and Pop was in bed, as uh, described, contracted, kind of almost just about able to grunt something. Um, I came in, and I just kind of patent, if you will, an entrance into a situation like that. I try to show a soft face, a soft voice, strength. I try to elicit uh, a connection right away. I generally go to the other side of the bed and put my hands on the patient. And as, the, as I'm talking to the son, I'm close to his father, I'm looking at his father. And the son is obviously like Lennox Hill now here, he's lost, uh, where is this all going? It's this notion of unpredictability of it all, uh, the courage that it takes. Uh, 
just trying to, trying to get into that bond. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And you go back to this long laundry list of elements and adjectives, uh, and you see the intentionality. I, by the act of coming in and immediately trying to address whatever objective concerns he has, but at the same time looking at the subjective concerns. Uh, what are we not doing for this man? Trust, devotion, all those things you try to, I don't know, can you teach them? Uh, you can model them. And you can hope that people standing next to you will pick up some of the vibe. Uh, you can gently coach when you see people well-intentioned going in the slightly wrong direction. But you can do work in that regard. And we have, uh, I think, succeeded in some cases to do that. You have to go and change with the rhythm of the, ch of the situation. You look for response. Response is very important. They've talked about this throughout the ages. There needs to be something back. And you make, make a show of the response. His, in his situation, he had fevers. He was relapsing. He was resistant to antibiotics. He went back to the hospital. So we try to prognosticate gently with the family. The task for the physician in the nursing home to prognosticate is impossible. Because I've said, and I said this uh, previously, I believe the, per the, the people in nursing homes are a self-selected population of survivors. They make liars out of prognosticators. Uh, they, uh, as did this gentleman, um, they beat the odds sometimes. The aphorism, or whatever, bromide, uh, of Dr. Stead, the longer the patient lives, the better the prognosis. I've used this many, many times. My master teacher, George Thornton at Yale, was, uh, was a, uh, Stead was a favorite of his in terms of the Oslerisms, if you will. But you know, there's an irony in that. The longer the patient lives, the better the prognosis. You're basically saying, my prognosis is going to be altered by the length that your dad makes it. Every day he lives, his prognosis is better. In fact, by the way, uh, your prognosis for longevity increases between the 90th and the 91st year. I don't, nobody knows why. You hit 90, you, you hit another little uh, down, you know, little uh, Now we also must listen and we must pick up the signs. Uh, the sun after my prognostication and also predictions of possible burdens and benefits of care. Peter Jr. was Peter also. Peter, I'm not sure it's gonna be worth sending Pop back. I really, and you know, we, we talked about it. The son was worried about giving up. I'm giving up. There are lectures and wonderful articles about giving up. What do you mean by giving up? Talk to the person. Let them, let them reflect on what they feel giving up means. We're not giving up. We're here with Pop. We're going to be with him till his last breath. And on and on. And there's some one wonderful treatments of that subject. He was still a full code. I'll risk the ventilator. He got off it once before. He'll beat it again, was his words. So I entered into a deep conversation a few times with Peter. We went into a private area, which is obviously important. And the environment of these conversations is very important. We shared tears. I talked about my dad. I talked about who was, the situation was very similar, but not the same. It's never the same. Each one is different. And I cried with him. And he, I thought I kind of had him with that. Uh, no, he wanted to go back. I mentioned Sharon here because she speaks of these poignant moments with patients as so important. And that really is, in my view, one of those high points of caring. It's fine either way. It's not for lack of trying. I, I don't love dad any less or the son any less for his going all the way, right? So the autonomy was there. They had the autonomy decision. He pushed back. He was a full code. So now, Mila, uh, I'd like to invite you up. And uh, this is on. I'll give you the level year. Uh, and just talk a little bit to this crowd about uh, your own sense of entering. Uh. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Lakage, for inviting me to speak here. Um, this case is very dear to my heart. 
um, when Peter passed away, um, I was very, very sad. I even wrote in my iPhone a prayer for Peter. Um, I just would like to read it to you, and um, uh, so it goes. Um, this was uh, dated November 22nd, 2010, at 9.47 p.m., probably before I went to sleep, because this day he was really looking bad, like we all were saying, oh, he's going to go. So they were all looking to me, like they would, they would look at me and they're like, oh, Mila, your boyfriend, he's not doing good. They would call him my boyfriend, because whenever I come in the room, he would just light up. Um, so I write, Lord, please watch over Peter tonight. You are the creator and the Lord of all. I thank you for all the wonderful moments I shared with Peter. In his eyes, sorry. Hello? Oh. All right, continue. Oh, sorry. okay. <clears throat> um, I thank you for all the wonderful moments I shared with Peter. In his eyes, by the way, he had beautiful blue eyes. <laughs> um, I saw joy, love, and appre appreciation. If you must take him with you to rest and be peaceful, please take with him all my love and care. I was really touched by Peter, and he was a good patient to me. He made me realize the true meaning of nursing. The smile I get, the bright eyes, the joyful greeting, the words of gratitude amidst suffering. All of that cannot be replaced by monetary value or any material gift. Please, Lord, take his hand from this moment on. I love you. Thank you. Um, so um, basically, in a nursing home, we come in, and then they give us assignments. And it so happened Peter was a, a patient on my assignment. He was actually transferred from another floor. And since it was a subacute, they were all talking about him because he was more of like a long-term care patient. So they were like, oh, this patient is a total care, you know. It's like when you go in the room, everything that I learned in nursing, I had to do to Peter. He had a G-tube on, oxygen, everything. Every, every, machine, every machine that you could think of was attached to Peter. So all the nurses were very skeptical about it, all the CNAs. But I went in there with the challenge to make a difference in Peter's life. And when I came out of the room, I realized something. It's the care that I give to Peter that would really make a difference. A simple smile, a simple response that I get from Peter would mean a lot to me. Because when I first came in, he would not say a word. The report that I got was he's nonverbal, he's aphasic. And I would tell them, he's like, oh, he said thank you to me. And he knows my name. And I would ask him, his name is Peter. Later on, you know, months go by, he was out of the bed. He would sing songs. Um, he loved Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and uh, at some point, he was on the G-Tube, and he would tell me, I want a sandwich, I want chicken. So he would just name all the food that he wanted to eat. And he would go to the hospital. He relapsed and got better and had all sorts of things happening to him. But um, the bottom line is um, nursing right now has become very difficult for nurses to actually give the care that we're supposed to, to be giving because of the time constraint and all the demands. But I think in the littlest time that a nurse is, is given, I think one must realize that in this profession, in this medical profession, there is a soul inside the body that we're trying to heal. And that's, I think that's the most important thing because nobody could take away your spirit. Nobody could take away your faith. Nobody could take away your soul. The health of your soul is eternal. You know, When you're sick, it doesn't mean that you don't have a soul anymore. Your soul stays with you. And if a nurse just touches a hand of a sick patient, hugs the patient, even though people would say that, oh, no, no, that's infection control, you can't do that. <laughs> I always think, I'm like, that could be my grandmother, that could be my grandfather. You know, anybody could, could, get, could get a hug, you know, they would need a hug. And I think they would appreciate that. So I don't really go by that, like no hugging, no kissing. I will put my face right into their face. I would tell them, I'm here. If you need anything, just call me. Uh, I will do anything in my power to help you. 
because at the end of the day, that's, you know, that's, that's life. We're all human beings, but we all have souls inside, and that's, that's what Dr. Lickage said, that's caring is what binds us all together as human beings. So. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, at Cardinal Cook, I've been there for about 16 years. I'm sorry. And I always say, a smile goes a long way. <laughs> huh? Oh. When you walk into a room and you go in, even though the patient is grumpy, but you go in with that smile and that openness about you, the patient will respond better. And with Peter, we always go in, me and Miller. Peter! And you always go, hi! And everybody say, he doesn't talk. But he always talks. But I think it's our tone of voice and knowing that we're good people and we mean, we've met well, right, Miller? <laughs> Those were, that's, that was very good. Now, obviously we all came from the same, I think, good intentions. Is there anything in your own upbringing, your own family, is there anything that sort of seems to make you have this come easier to you and that you can share? Well, I was taught that you always treat people with respect. Always treat people the way how you would want to be treated. And that's a good thing. And you mentioned the other day about trust, that you try to win over the person's trust. You, <laughs> um, walking into a door, you always gotta let people know that I'm here for you, you can trust me. You can tell me anything, because I'll be there for you. And once somebody has that trust in you and that faith in you, it's always easy to take care of them. And the families uh, rally around that when they see it. Yes, they do, especially when you smile. Was there any particular time with Mr. Peter that the family dynamic and the family uh, may have upset you or did you push too hard to help them? Send them back to the hospital? No. You went along with their... I went, went along with them, did whatever they need, whatever that was needed to be done, and made them feel comfortable and happy. Good. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You're so great. <laughs> I'm going to come back in a, in a second, Norma, to you. I just want to talk uh, a little bit about his course and uh, round it out with... Uh, kind of a coda to what Mila said. Uh, he did have many relapses, and he went on this way for nine months. Uh, his prognosis in no way, shape, or form would have been more than uh, a matter of weeks after what he had been through. Uh, there was this uh, additional push to stop hospitalizing. Uh, Peter Jr. and I had another conversation, and he, he kind of didn't answer, but he didn't say no, he didn't say yes, but the fact is, Dad was so sick one, at one evening I had to send him out. That to me was kind of the last straw in a way because he really was nearing death and to the point where uh, he could have been put on a ventilator at, uh, at the hospital from which he would not have come off and he would have died uh, at Lenox Hill on a ventilator or at Mount Sinai. So he came back. Uh, I really basically was trying to uh, set the stage, if you will, for the final few days um, I came on the floor, Mila was there, uh, and we exchanged comments about how he looked, uh, and went on through that, that day. And at noon, I came back on the floor to see what was going on, and Mila said, Dr. Legich, I want to show you something. So I came in the room, Peter's up, he's in a chair, his hair is combed, his blue eyes were glistening, and she said, don't you look great today? And he smiled, she went over and gave him a kiss on the cheek, and he beamed. Uh, so for the last time, I, I gave up, and I said, basically, I, I'm not going to prognosticate anymore. Um, but that really was his near his end. Two days later, he went into a rapid respiratory pattern. Peter, I called him at home. We talked it over, and he said, OK, Doc, this will be it. Um, and then he came in. He stayed and lived. Uh, the family came, gathered with him, uh, and he passed away in the we small hours of the, of the night after. Um, so uh, I did give uh, Peter a bereavement call. 
Um, and I know, Mila, you went to the funeral wake. Um, this was one that we, we don't go this far all the time, obviously, but it was such an instructive case in so many ways I think you'll appreciate. Uh, we just need to ride the ups and downs with, uh, with, our, with our patients. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly, uh, and then I want to open it up, uh, some of the education uh, points on this. Um, Mila and I spoke earlier. She just recently graduated, still uh, studying for her bachelor's in nursing. Uh, if there's any particular quality time on the curriculum of nursing schools now that really get to the heart of where Mila just was, um, maybe you want to just uh, make a comment on that. And uh, uh, I know that's a little awkward with this bloody thing. What if I walk over here? Do I get electrocuted? No. Okay. Well, this conversation took place on our way here to the hospital, and Novara, Miss um, Coleman's daughter, we were just talking about how when you go into law enforcement, they give you like a psychological test to determine if you're really fit for the job because nursing is not just any job. You're not dealing with machines to troubleshoot machines. You're not dealing with any equipment. You know, you're dealing with people, not only the people, but actually the people who love these people that are sick. So for you to become a nurse, it's not just for the money. It, ha it cannot be just for the money. Because a lot of people go into nursing because it's the easiest, you know, it's a short, in a short span of time, you could become an RN and earn a lot of money. So um, I believe in the nursing curriculum. Before you could actually go into nursing, it could not be like, uh, it could not stop you from being a nurse, but I think before you could enter into college, they should do like a psychological test if you're really fit for nursing, if you really want to endure that selfless, caring that you will actually give to the patients. Because right now, um, nursing is, is very difficult. It, it has a lot, you have to study a lot. And then when you actually become a nurse, not, not, uh, a lot of people will think that, you know, you have eight patients or you'll have like 10 patients, but I actually have 26 patients to take care of. Well, in my case, I have 51 patients to actually oversee. So in an eight hour um, shift, you cannot really give that care that you want to give them, so. Could they use role playing or vignettes or things in school that may create a Peter situation? Or do they, no. have you not experienced that? No. In medical school, we'll get to that in a second, but they do try that, and it has some measure of success. The outcome seems to have some impact. It's a very brief course in, in one of the subjects, but it's not, it's not dedicated fully to okay. caring. Norma, come on up for a second. Can you handle it? Okay. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> uh, okay. So we talked a little bit about the support before with the groups, uh, uh, the support group. Norma's been working. Well, tell, tell the group a little bit about yourself. And then okay. Hello. My name is Norma Coleman. I'm a CNA. I've been a CNA for 10 years now. And I've worked in hospice before. I worked in the homes of hospice. Um, I grew up in a loving, caring environment. I always give love and care back first. Um, I don't think twice about it. I don't judge people. Um, I just love helping people. That's just me. I'm, I don't look for a prize or try to gain anything, just a lot of love and comfort. When I see that I'm helping the person and they get a smile or a laugh and just a tickle, I make little jokes with them, that makes me feel good. It makes me feel good to make another person feel good, even if they are when they're sick and feeling down, I do my best to pep them up 
If they want water six times, I get them water six times because I know they just want to see my face. So I just make sure <laughs> I try to keep everybody happy because um, I had a bad experience in life at one time when I was young. I lost my mother, you know, in a tragic tragedy. I lost her. And through the time that I lost her, I don't know, some spiritual guidance came over me. And the Lord let me know, don't be sad. Look up, my girl. It's going to be all right. There's someone else's place that you could take to fulfill that. And so that's just me. I'm loving and caring, and I don't look for no reward for it because the reward that I get from it is a person gaining their health, their laughter, or just to call me, call my name, just to continue to call me and make a laugh or a joke. And it's just, I'm just a loving, caring person. I don't know, and it's from my heart. You know, I don't know much, but I know how to love and care for a person and be who I am, normal, you know. That's who I am. That's who I am. Well, we love you for that. And uh, in terms of uh, the training for CNAs, is there any attention paid? It's obviously deeply natural to you, but I wonder sometimes if we can't do a better job. We can always do a better job. There's always room for, you know, to get better in this, in this, um, in the healthcare, it's always room to get better because, like Mila was saying, you have a lot of people that's going in for nursing. They can pass the test right away, but they don't provide the care for the person because they're so busy thinking about the check. But they got to remember, it's not about the check; it's about this human being. You're gonna get paid at the end of the day, regardless. So if you're gonna do your eight hours, do your eight hours right. If you can't do it right, I don't know what to say for that person. You know, they don't have a conscience. They don't have no spiritual feeling. And that's what we really need to pray to a higher power one for people having a good conscience and good spiritual feelings to make this world like it used to be or like it can be. That's all we're looking for in life. We here as all different races of people to help one another. That's why the higher power being put us here. You know, nobody is no less or no more than anyone. That's just the way I feel. Okay. Great. Thank you. Tough act to follow these people. But it's true. <laughs> Medical school, uh, I think there is uh, some considerable gains in that regard. They are trying role playing, they're using, uh, uh, I forgot the term now, it's an on oncology. Uh, tutorial. Uh, I read in a residency program they were uh, also uh, talking about advanced directives. Uh, it's an incredible burden to try to bring up the subject of advanced directives. We've been struggling with that in the nursing home because of the new laws. Because you really have to prognosticate, you have to talk to the patients about things uh, in, a, in a sense that are unpredictable. Uh, so it becomes uh, a challenge to say the least. I think it's, uh, it'd be appropriate at this juncture, if there's anyone that have uh, questions and want to share anything about this subject, this uh, notion of caring, uh, getting something back when we give something out, uh, please. I think we have a dead mic. If, uh, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, well, we haven't really developed uh, anything per se. We've had uh, attempts at training. Uh, we've had uh, wonderful interns through the, cent uh, through the center come through the facility. Uh, we did develop a tutorial for end of life care and piloted on different units in the nursing home where the nurses' aides were present, the nurses were present. We go through symptom management, things to look for, um, and so on. So the answer is kind of a, a weak yes. Questions? Sister. Uh, I just wanted to comment about the CNA, the Certified Nursing Assistant, um, as well as the, the nurses, because um, so often um, I think it's, it's the CNA and the nurse who is able to identify what the real need
जी सर आप Uh, great question. It's, uh, it is politically charged and driven as finance has, tend to, has tended to drive politics in healthcare from the advent of Medicare and way before Social Security. My answer would be that uh, it's definitely recognized that the expenditures in the last three months of life, there's plenty of uh, actuarial analyses of that, uh, is off the charts, billions and billions. Um, we are now trying to push for the rehospitalization initiatives where we want to stop rehospitalizations. That translates to better end of life discussion, better end of life care, having the conversation with families, uh, educating the families, doing the kinds of things I try to do with Peter uh, globally. There are 1.5 million people living in nursing homes, another uh, as many living in assisted living, and probably twice as many as the disabled at home, right? So you're up around six, seven million. Those people, as they reach, push toward the end, become frequent flyers, if you will, and heavy uh, users. What I fail to see, though, is a recognition how there needs to be an investment in the nurturance uh, of people such as these ladies, and perhaps myself. There needs to be somebody coming in who helps us do better at that. Uh, the rewards now still are not there. They're, they're, it's, it's still misguided where one MRI uh, will cost uh, enough to fund uh, a month of one of those interns' good work to put together a tutorial for the staff. I mean, I, I, I don't think I could quickly answer in terms of the cost analysis, but Right now, they, they've recognized it. The laws have changed with the Family Health uh, Self-Determination Act. So in June of 2011, suddenly, uh, if, if the patient is demented, prior to that, you'd have to literally go to a court and try to get some advanced directives placed. Now, the family can decide, even if mom never said exactly what she wanted her, uh, as her advanced directive. So, so, so the laws have now shifted in favor of discussion allowing conservative care plans and so on. Hospice is kind of out there. Uh, hospice to me uh, has not really worked completely well. Um, there are some financial problems where it may not be as much of a saver as you think. We have issues, uh, and we have Calvary Hospice, which is one of the best, but there are still sometimes a siloization of end of life, uh, which we're trying like hell not to let that happen and keep keeping uh, the actual care of the patient in the hands of the team on the floor. I don't know if I've answered your question, but I think that there is a movement in the right direction um, and it needs to be grown in the back.
the first one I would say is uh, there is a support network. We have a strong pastoral care department. They work on the floors and they, they are available uh, for counseling not only of the families, but sometimes the staff will quietly pull some of us aside. I, I think it's way under addressed and that came out in that support group I spoke of on the Huntington's unit. Uh, I think we could go a lot further with that. The hospice, Calvary Hospice is available. They have um, mental health experts on bereavement and, and issues of dying. But it's not very strong. I think uh, uh, I've seen uh, people uh, quietly going off into the corner, upset, crying, um, and only by accident in a way come upon just what, what uh, heartache they're, they're suffering. I've been shocked at the number of times nurses aides attend funerals of patients that uh, I had never realized there was that much of a bond that they would take the time to go to Queens somewhere and go to a funeral. So it's an unmet need, uh, I would say. Um, the, uh, what, was the other, what was the other question? Children. Yeah, the children. Uh, well, that's an interesting one. I think that uh, uh, there is a lot of subtext at times in the dynamic around the bedside. Uh, one case comes to mind where there were three different, actually five children, two, three were there constantly, fighting constantly, uh, because they had different views of what mother wanted. Uh, and then slowly, we were able to allow them to literally stay in the room 24 seven for months, for two months at least. But there was a lot of family dynamic and there were certain nurses aides, I think, who really were able to get be between some of those family dynamics and there would be some tension. Um, I think most of the time though, the appreciation is there, even if there is a feeling, you know, I never got that close to my own mother as, uh, as you seem to be. And uh, you know, somebody like Norma, maybe you wanna comment on that if that ever happened. Uh, would say, whatever, however it's happening, it's good that it's happening. If it's me, so be it. If it's you, there's still time. I was really disappointed in this gentleman when the family came after death. Uh, uh, that one we didn't win. We didn't, we didn't win that round. Russell. Um, question about training. That's a great question, and you're, I agree with you. Something does happen. We teach the senior geriatric students. For years, I had six or seven a month from New York Medical College. And I would really study their kind of you know, tea leaves of them. Uh, and there would be a, an assortment of, of what we're talking about. Um, my sense is that the curriculum is so front-loaded with in, stuff that we would never, we never were subjected to. The curriculum is packed now. And there is some sort of lip service to the softer things, but they really get into the subspecialty. They get energized by micro orthopedic surgery, uh, certain subspecialties that are lucrative. Uh, I don't know where they lose it, but there is this, their role models may not be perfect. They may not really have the heroes that I had when I was going through these things, including uh, summer in England where I really saw some serious uh, 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 devotion to this side of medicine. Um, I would say th the environment is, uh, is hostile at times and they look at the bad side and the litigious families or the anger and they're not taught to look beyond that. and and to recall what it is they were, they really meant when they said help. Uh, you can get beat up and still help somebody. 
I don't know exactly. Any other thoughts as to where they might lose it? I, I'd be interested to know if other people have thoughts on that. Um, they become jaded, I guess, would be the term. Uh, but not all. I know there was one fellow that we took in the Chelsea Village program. He came out with us with Sister Teresita. And he said that he was jaded, but he came unjaded after that ride. <laughs> Maria. That, that reminds me of something also. The length of stay in the hospital today is four days. When I was at St. Vincent's, it was 24 days uh, on a good, uh, I mean, we literally became fast friends and relatives of people They were in the hospital for so long. And we were there, I was on every other night on medicine. So you were literally in the hospital uh, more than you weren't. And you got to know people real well. Now it's four days, it's like, a, it's like Lucille Ball on the uh, donut uh, scene. <laughs> I think the question was, uh, what gets lost among the people whom the questioner knew wished to go to medical school? But my experience at uh, many decades of uh, recommending people to medical school is that the American Medical Association curriculum uh, is pegged far more to the first two years of medical school than to any residency degree. And you get what you select. My sense is so long as the admission process is paid to a high GPA in the sciences without asking about anything else, you can get people with a high GPA in the sciences and they may or may not have the skills, the emotional skills you're looking for. There's some work out of Stanford that suggests that, that actually happens and that's beginning to change medical school first year structures, but the AMCAS testing hasn't changed. If you can't answer the right question on a short answer, Actually, the irony of that, there was a reason of break in that front where the MCATs are changing. They're actually revamping the whole thing to bring out some of these sensitivity uh, detector questions. Uh, that remains to be seen how effective they're going to be. Um, and uh, so that's good news. And um, there was another point on that. Uh, the interview process for medical school has now this pan uh, group of interviewees and they have staged interviews where you have scenarios where the student who's being interviewed has to make judgments about what to do next. So there is that. I don't know how informed they are psychologically. I mean, this comes back to the, uh, uh, the when you want a uh, law enforcement career, you know, you really have to be, you have to think twice about who you put a gun, whose hand you put a gun in. Uh, so there is some hope, but uh, and they're recognizing it. Anybody else? Joanne. Tony. Yes. I would like to to consider taking your show on the road, and I wish the ladies don't go alone. And, <laughs> and start right where we are at these stages of the game. I think you're right, Joanne, and I think that. Uh, Thanks, Joanne. I, 
I, I think it's a great question. Uh, Nell Nottings, who taught at Columbia, I don't know if you knew her, Bob, but she, uh, I dropped uh, some of the slides that I devoted, not that they weren't worth showing. She was a feminist woman who wrote a seminal book in, uh, in no pun intended, uh, in uh, 1984, uh, as, and, and it was basically the feminist, uh, feminism as nurturer, and she went into her whole caring uh, discussion uh, on kind of harvesting feminine attributes in a sense in this in this discussion and now that has evolved I, I think the answer to me now is uh, probably there is something uh, that still makes nurses preponderantly women uh, medical students are now preponderantly women uh, so there seems to be some legitimacy in the, in the gender issue there. But I mean, uh, I think uh, um, it's up to the training and the role modeling. Uh, I don't think that should be a, a, you know, a restriction, if you will, or a limitation. Yeah, out of time. Thank Tony again to say to you all that if you'll go to our website and keep checking it, this and all the other talks we have get edited by our student colleagues and they get put up on the website in streaming video. And uh, that is our best shot at giving uh, an extended audience to this talk and others. And if you have any further comments to us, please send them to the CSSR and we'll get them to Tony and we'll work on whatever you think is important for us to take from this. And thank you all. Thanks for coming.